tonight. Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. At question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In June 2021, the Scottish Government were told to retain messages relevant to their handling of the COVID pandemic. But five months later, the SNP introduced a policy to destroy WhatsApp messages. This is the digi digital equivalent of building a bonfire to torch the evidence. So, First Minister, why did the SNP bring in a policy to delete messages after they have been told to keep them? First Minister. First of all, of course, the policy being referred to by Douglas Ross is a general policy around messaging, uh, mobile uh, messaging, including formal messaging, uh, such as uh, WhatsApp. Of course, what is key when we got the advisory notices, both uh, well, particularly from the Scottish inquiry, and then, of course, uh, when we received information from the UK government in relation to the UK uh, inquiry, it was made very clear to <coughs> officials, to civil servants, of course, to ministers, to cabinet secretaries, that any information uh, that was relevant or could be potentially relevant to the inquiries should be retained and, of course, appropriately recorded within our record management system. That is why 14,000 WhatsApp messages are in the process of being handed over now that we have the Section 21 order. It's why 19,000 documents have already been submitted. It's why, when I submit my final statement, it will have unredacted WhatsApp messages handed over to the inquiry. I should say, Presiding Officer, that is in very stark contrast to the Prime Minister, who tried to take the public inquiry to court, lost, of course, in the courts, and is still refusing to hand over his WhatsApp messages. Douglas Ross. People viewing this are listening to the First Minister to tell us what the Scottish Government are doing. And it is not up to Hamza Youssef or any SNP minister, current or former, to decide what is relevant to the inquiry, to pick and choose which messages are going to be handed over. Because it is absolutely clear that the SNP brought in an auto-delete policy, not just after being told not to do so by the UK COVID inquiry, but after Nicola Sturgeon had set up a separate Scottish inquiry. This policy was introduced two months later. Nicola Sturgeon went on television to say she couldn't withhold messages even if she wanted to. But this week, it was reported that Nicola Sturgeon has deleted her WhatsApp messages. We know that destroying or withholding evidence from an inquiry is illegal. So does Hamza Youssef accept that if Nicola Sturgeon or any government minister has destroyed WhatsApp messages relevant to the inquiry, they would be breaking the law? First Minister. As Douglas Ross has mentioned, the former uh, First Minister, let me just remind Douglas Ross and indeed the Chamber, in terms of accountability and transparency, Nicola Sturgeon stood up day after day, every, virtually every single day, did 250 media briefings, Members. 70 parliamentary statements, and full accountability, full transparency, First Minister, First Minister, answering Minister, questions. First they don't Minister, want to hear it, presiding officer, because of First course, Minister, if you might take allegations. a seat for a moment. We're not going to continue this session in this vein. Members are required to conduct themselves in an orderly manner. Let's treat one another with courtesy and respect, and let's not decide to contribute from our seats. First Minister. And can I remind the opposition, particularly the Conservatives, when the former First Minister stood up, did those daily media briefings, spoke to the public, took questions from the media, it was the opposition that wanted to stop that from happening in the first place. Let me be... Let me be absolutely clear. Let me be absolutely clear, because this is such an important issue. First Minister, particularly Mr Kerr, I must ask you to cease shouting from your seat. I'd be very grateful if you could comply. First Minister. It is important, I think, that uh, opposition members don't shout from a sedentary position, because there are members, families of those who have been bereaved by COVID who do want assurances. And I accept, and let me reiterate what the Deputy First Minister said a couple of days ago in this chamber, the government does apologise to those families who are bereaved by COVID for any anxiety or distress that we have uh, caused them. That was certainly not our intention. We received, of course, 
uh, clarification uh, from the COVID inquiry last week around their expectations. They have provided us with that Section 21 order. We are in the process of providing 14,000 WhatsApp messages. And on top of that, I will give my WhatsApp messages unredacted to the COVID inquiry because we set up that inquiry for one reason and for one reason only, to get to the truth and to ensure answers are there for those families who suffered the most during COVID. Dr. Shaws. I cannot believe that Hamza Youssef has just stood up and in the strongest possible way defended Nicola Sturgeon, who has been accused of deleting vital WhatsApp messages. And he didn't answer the question, would she have broken the law if she has done so? But the law is very clear. Deleting evidence required by an inquiry is a criminal offence. It's in writing in the Scottish COVID inquiries uh, letter. The SNP government were told to make sure that no material of potential relevance to the inquiry is destroyed, deleted or disposed of. It is an offence under section 35 of the Inquiries Act. But the problem with the SNP's policy is the messages are deleted before the inquiry can judge if they're relevant or not. Or not. Yeah. Hamza Youssef has previously told this chamber, and I quote, any material that's asked for will absolutely be handed over to the COVID inquiries and handed over in full. So why has the SNP government now failed to deliver on that promise by deleting evidence? First Minister. Douglas Ross continues to say that we are not handing over WhatsApp messages. That is incorrect. We are in the process of handing over 14,000 messages. On top of those 14,000 messages, when I submit my final statement, I'll be handing over um, many messages, uh, not, just with, not just with Cabinet Secretary, not just with Ministers, of course with UK Government Ministers, with opposition politicians that I communicated with across the Chamber. And I will be doing so unredacted because we believe, this government believes, in accountability. Very different to Douglas Ross's leader of the Conservative Party, who's refusing to hand the, that material over. And I understand why Douglas Ross wants to talk about process as opposed to substance. The reason why, of course, is because just in this week alone, we have seen utterly scathing, damning evidence about the UK government's handling or mishandling of the COVID pandemic. So, look, I am absolutely committed, and this government is absolutely committed, to being transparent, to being accountable, because we want the truth of uh, the truth to be heard, not just by the public, but particularly by the families who are bereaved by COVID. We certainly don't have anything to fear from the truth. I suspect the Conservatives absolutely do. Hamza Youssef is all over the place with this. He starts off by saying he's going to hand over all the messages. Now, Let's now, hear he's, Mr. Saying, Ross. now he's saying he's going to hand over many of them. He doesn't hide from the truth. We don't know what the truth is because messages have been deleted. And they've been deleted because of a policy of the SNP government. That policy means they can cherry pick the information that the inquiry sees. Crucial discussions may have been destroyed by their auto delete policy. Any uncomfortable information may be lost, never to see the light of day. This secretive approach treats the COVID inquiry and grieving families with contempt. Well, the Deputy First Minister is saying no, it doesn't. So Shona Robeson, listen to Margaret Waterton, who lost her mother and her... Well, Jenny Galruth, listen to someone who lost their mother Mr. and Ross. husband to the Mr. virus. Ross. I'd be very grateful if members would do one another, give one another courtesy and respect. When a member is meant to be speaking in this chamber, let's listen to them. Mr Ross. Senior government ministers within the SNP don't want to hear what grieving families think about their actions. So Margaret Waterton, who lost her mother and husband to the virus, said the news that the Scottish Government has withheld the evidence from the COVID inquiry is, and I quote, frankly shameful. And Jane Morrison, a member of Scottish COVID Bereave said, if someone deliberately deleted stuff to avoid us getting to the truth, then morally and ethically, as well as legally, it's totally in the wrong. So does the First Minister regret letting down these families and so many others? First Minister. I, I, I think it's really important because Douglas Ross has every right to ask the questions he is asking. 
we have a responsibility, I think, in this chamber to remember that there's many people who lost loved ones to COVID, including many people in this chamber, including members of uh, my own government. And what I would say is reiterate the apology made by the Deputy First Minister to Scottish uh, COVID uh, family, Scottish COVID uh, bereaved, uh, and indeed uh, to their representatives, uh, that we did not mean to cause them the anxiety that they clearly felt uh, as a result of uh, what was said at uh, the COVID inquiry last week. That is uh, on us, uh, and we intend to make right with that, and that is why we'll release those 14,000 messages, and I will release uh, my own uh, messages uh, as well. So the absolute purpose of the inquiry uh, is to get to the truth of the handling and whether there were mistakes made to learn from those mistakes. And ultimately, everybody will have an interest in that. Businesses across the country will have an interest in that, members of the public, but most particularly, most acutely, uh, will be those families who have been bereaved uh, by COVID. So I can give them an absolute assurance that we are here to cooperate fully uh, with uh, the inquiries. And let me just remind uh, Douglas Ross what we already know about his party's mishandling of COVID. Those families who could not say goodbye to their loved Members. ones, those families who had to attend funerals by themselves, without their family, without friends uh, around them, they were doing that all the while yeah. the Conservatives were partying, yeah. breaking COVID rules yeah. in number 10. Briefly, First because Minister. Because we know the Conservatives, they don't believe that the rules, frankly, apply uh, to them. And we have seen that in the evidence this week. So I can give an absolute commitment Thank you, to First officer, Minister. that the Scottish Government will fully co co cooperate with both inquiries. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Presiding officer, during the worst of the COVID-19 pandemic in Scotland, thousands of people died. It's for those people that we should be thinking about our answers and our questions today. This government sent untested and COVID-positive patients into care homes with devastating consequences, and millions suffered from the effects of lockdown. That is why both the UK and Scottish COVID inquiries are crucial, because we need to understand what happened to learn lessons for the future. Now, the Deputy First Minister and First Minister have talked a lot about individual responsibility in relation to the inquiry, but the First Minister is responsible for the conduct of the Scottish Government. So will he take personal responsibility for ensuring the Government complies in full with all requests from the COVID inquiry? First Minister. It is, of course, my responsibility, uh, and of course, uh, I will uh, liaise closely, as, as, as Anas, I would imagine I would, uh, with the Permanent Secretary to ensure that the organisation uh, fully complies. I said that to Anas Awar uh, previously. We, of course, uh, will hand over whatever material uh, that has been uh, retained from the Scottish Government. That is why 14,000 messages are in the process, WhatsApp messages are in the process of being handed over. I should say that is on top of the 19,000 yeah. documents that we have already uh, submitted. So it is appropriate that, of course, uh, every single uh, member of the government, every single official in the government, uh, complies. I should say to Anasawa on the specific point he asks, I am of course responsible for my witness statement. I don't know of course what other requests have gone to individual ministers, to individual cabinet secretaries, uh, nor do I know what they have submitted. And that is appropriate. And he, Anasawa is mouthing why. The reason why of course is there's confidentiality in a public inquiry which must of course be adhered to. If I try to break that, Anasawa would be the first one to, say, to drag me over the hot coals and say, why on earth are you breaching confidentiality of an inquiry that could uh, potentially prejudice any said inquiry? And just to make it absolutely clear, my understanding is that that information about the confidentiality of the inquiry has been put into spice, yeah. but we can make sure that Anna Sarwar gets a copy for his information. Yeah. Anna Sarwar. Presiding officer, I think Hamza Youssef is missing the central point. He is the First Minister. He's responsible for the actions of the Scottish Government, ministers and officials, not just his own responsibility as an individual. And I don't think he's read the transcript from the COVID inquiry last week, which is absolutely damning about the actions of this government and his own behaviour. In June, I asked the First Minister directly, and I quote, will he confirm that all ministers and officials, past and present, have complied with the Do Not Destroy instruction? And will he give a guarantee that all requests, emails, text and WhatsApp messages will be handed over in full to the inquiry? He gave a direct answer. He said, and I quote, yes, they will. No equivocation, 
no caveats, no grey areas. But we now know the messages have been deleted. And crucially, it's for the judge to decide what is relevant, not for individual ministers and officials to decide what is relevant. And again, this is about the conduct of the Scottish Government. So can the First Minister tell us, of the 70 ministers and officials, how many have failed to comply with the Do Not Destroy notice and how many have deleted messages? First Minister. Can we just uh, be absolutely uh, clear about this? Uh, Anna Sawar. Members. Anna Sawar is asking me to demand from individual witnesses their witness statement so that I can see what they have handed over or what they have not handed over. Because that is the only way I could know if former ministers uh, have submitted information or not submitted Members, information. Members, let's hear the First that Minister. Is. That would be, in my view, a pretty serious breach in terms of the confidentiality of the inquiry. In terms of the organisation, which is what Anna Sawar has also asked me about, yes, it is absolutely my expectation, the expectation of the Permanent Secretary, that potentially relevant information is kept, recorded in the appropriate way, and handed over to the inquiry when that is requested. That is why, of course, we are in the process of handing over 14,000 messages. And Anna Sarwar is absolutely right. 14,000 of those messages, many of them, I suspect, I don't know because I haven't seen the detail, but I suspect, given that they were on WhatsApp groups, as we understand, as, as, as the Deputy First Minister uh, outlined uh, earlier this week, many of them may not be relevant. Anna Sarwar is right. That is for the, is for the inquiry to determine. Hence why I, as First Minister, will hand over all of my WhatsApp messages in an unredacted form. Because I go back to the point that I made to Douglas Ross. The reason for this inquiry, the Scottish inquiry being set up, was to get to the truth of matters. And that's why, in the terms of reference, the issue around the discharge of patients is clearly one of the issues that the inquiry will examine and one that we will fully cooperate with. Anna Sarwar. Presiding officer, the public can see, and indeed the inquiry can see, that the First Minister was unequivocal in June and now they can see how he's dodging responsibility in his answer to give today. And it's also clear that the Section 21 notice was issued to the government, not to individuals and ministers and officials. And it's the government that's responsible for collating and providing that evidence to the inquiry. So to abdicate responsibility, I think, is frankly shameful. And people will see that right across the country. But the harsh reality is this, presiding officer, the First Minister has lost control of his government. He doesn't know how many ministers or officials have complied with the Do Not Destroy notice. He doesn't know how many have deleted messages. And he claims that the government's response to the inquiry is for individuals rather than for his government. The First Minister promised this chamber he would ensure all material was handed to the inquiry in full. And this week we've seen how important these messages are. So can I ask the First Minister, why does he believe his government should be held to a lower standard than the Tories at Westminster? What is he doing to identify those who do not comply with the Do Not Destroy notices? And what action is he taking against those who failed to comply? Or should we conclude that his word means nothing? First Minister. Uh, President Officer, let me try to clarify again uh, some of the issues that Anna Sarwar uh, has raised. It's important to say, and this is crucial, that when it came to the request from the UK government inquiry, uh, they, in, in, in June, the inquiry asked us for details of the various groups, the WhatsApp groups concerning uh, COVID-19. They did not request the messages themselves. The messages themselves were asked for in September, just a matter of weeks uh, ago. We then, of course, the government, asked for a Section 21 uh, order uh, because of the personal information yeah. uh, in some of those messages. And that was received. And now, of course, we will meet that, the, the deadline uh, for the 6th of November to hand over 14,000 uh, messages in unredacted form. And I can hear Jackie Bailey shouting, destroyed. The 14,000 messages have not been destroyed. We're handing them over. And they include ministers, past and present. We don't know the ministers because, again, for confidentiality purposes. But we know that they do include ministers, past and uh, present. I go back uh, to the point here that Anna Sawar, Douglas Ross, have every right to ask uh, about messages being handed over. So I can give an unequivocal uh, guarantee to those families who have been bereaved by COVID that the messages that we have retained will absolutely be handed over and handed over in full. And that as First Minister, as the head of this government, I will, when submitting my statement, be handing over my messages 
in full and unredacted, presiding officer. Question number three, Pam Gossel. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the First Minister whether he will provide an update on waiting times for post-cancer breast reconstruction surgery. First Minister. We recognise the importance of breast reconstruction surgery. Uh, I'm aware that there are still uh, unacceptable waits in some specialities, but we are, of course, committed to delivering sustained improvements and year-on-year -year reductions through service redesign and also uh, through national working. Waiting times are not published by individual procedure. However, the most recent national statistics from June show that there was almost 7,500 patients waiting for inpatient day case treatment in, in the plastic surgery speciality in Scotland. Breast reconstru reconstruction surgery covers a range of procedures uh, and delays can be caused by a number of factors. And we know, of course, the impact that the pandemic has had, but I can assure Pam Gosso that we are working hard to ensure that we've reduced those waiting times. Pam Gosso. I thank the First Minister for that response. Breast cancer treatment is not just physically demanding, it is emotionally taxing too. Reconstructive surgery gives women the chance to regain control of their bodies. A freedom of information response I've received shows the average wait time for this surgery is nearly 400 days in Greater Glasgow and Clyde. But for my constituent, it has been more than three and a half years since her mastectomy. She was told she would have a date for her surgery by 21st of October. The date has come and gone. Does the First Minister accept that this is not good enough? What steps will he take to cut waiting times for this surgery and ensure that patients such as my constituent are not left waiting for years? First Minister. Can I thank um, Pam Gosso for raising the case of her constituent? I obviously don't know the details, but Pam Gosso uh, can write to me if she hasn't done so already. Uh, I'd be happy to look at the, the case. The Health Secretary would be happy to raise it uh, with the Health Board because I do agree with Pam Gosso's premise that waits of that length are unacceptable. Um, and uh, Pam Gosso speaks uh, powerfully around uh, the emotional and physical impact uh, of uh, breast cancer in particular. We have been, uh, uh, of course, uh, working uh, towards uh, improvements in waiting times. Uh, we have met the 31-day standard as by the most recent statistics, but I'm afraid uh, fallen short uh, where we need to be in terms of the 62-day uh, uh, standard. So we'll continue to uh, progress uh, work and action to reduce those waiting lists. Uh, I will ensure that the Cabinet Secretary for Health writes in detail to Pam Gosso about some of the actions uh, we are taking. But in the meantime, if Pam Gosso does provide me the details of her constituent, uh, we will, of course, uh, uh, liaise with the Health Board to see if there's anything further that can be done. Question number four, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government is taking to increase public awareness of firework safety ahead of Bonfire Night. First Minister. We have recently launched our annual public awareness campaigns across a range of media platforms. These campaigns reinforce the appropriate messaging around attending organised displays and how to stay safe over the Bonfire Weekend. I encourage everyone to familiarise themselves with those campaigns and with the firework code. Additionally, we've distributed over 200,000 safety leaflets to retailers and the Scottish Wholesale Association trading standard teams and third sector partners to increase awareness of firework safety and the law at the point of sale. It is, of course, illegal to buy or give fireworks to anyone under the age of 18 to use fireworks before 6 p.m. or after 11 p.m. That's extended to midnight on the 5th and it's also legal to use fireworks in the street or other public places. Ultimately, this is so the public and, crucially, our emergency services can have a safe bonfire night. Claire Adamson. Thank the First Minister for his answer. Recent data from Scottish Fire and Rescue shows that the number of deliberate fires in the three weeks up to November 5th has fallen by 30% since 2018 to 907 this, uh, last year. This is very welcome news, but every year our emergency workers are subjected to immense pressure through to the misuse of fireworks compounded with antisocial behaviour. Would the First Minister agree that the public can do a real service to our emergency services by taking the decision to attend a public display, which is by far, far and away the safest and most enjoyable way for a family to spend on the evening of Bonfire Night? First Minister. I do, I do agree with that uh, from Claire Adamson. Fireworks can be a great spectacle and enable communities to come together as injuries are less likely to occur 
at a public display, we would always encourage people to attend one. I know many communities, regional, national organisations, as well as local authorities, do fantastic work to organise such displays. Uh, as members uh, know, we have strengthened the law around access to the use of fireworks with the aim to reduce demand on our emergency services. The new law also makes attacks against emergency workers an aggravated offence that can be considered by courts when sentencing uh, offenders. So I would uh, do as uh, Claire Adamson has articulated very well, encourage people to attend those public displays where they are available. Russell Finlay. Thank you. SNP ministers claim their new firework control zones will improve public safety around bonfire night, but my party has found that at least 28 of Scotland's 32 councils have no plans to introduce them. This includes Dundee, where riot police are on the streets to tackle gangs using fireworks to inflict chaos and terror. So can Hamza Yusuf explain why his rushed firework law is being ignored by councils suffering from severe SNP cuts? First Minister. It is, of course, for local authorities to make an application for a control zone. I'm assuming that Conservative-led councils have also uh, don't have control zones uh, in place. So I don't think we should be blaming uh, local authorities, nor indeed the government, for the actions that we saw no, in Dundee. Exactly. Uh, we should be very, very clear that those who misuse fireworks, particularly uh, endangering the public, particularly endangering our emergency services, they should be the ones that should be held to account for their Absolutely. reckless actions. We should be Absolutely. getting behind yeah. our fire service, getting behind Police Scotland to do a fantastic job and our ambulance service to do a fantastic job uh, in the run-up to Bonfire Night and Bonfire Night itself. But we have brought forward legislation. There are a number of applications in for a control zone and, of course, they will be uh, given due consideration. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I declare an interest as convener of the cross-party group on animal welfare. First Minister, the safety of people, especially children, is obviously paramount. But does the First Minister agree with me that we should be mindful of the effect of fireworks on our pets and indeed livestock to keep them safe too, and if in doubt what to do, to follow the advice of animal organisations, including the NFUS? First Minister. Yes, I do agree with that. There's some excellent guidance from a number of our sector partners. NFUS is one of them. I know from the SSPCA uh, and others, there's some very good guidance uh, up because uh, Christine Graham is, is right. We, we often focus on, on members of the public. Uh, that should absolutely include uh, our pets uh, as well, who we know uh, can suffer uh, during the lead-up to Bonfire Night and Bonfire Night itself. But I would do, as Christine Graham has suggested, uh, for those who are unsure about uh, animal welfare and safety during this period, uh, please do look at a range of third sector organisations who can provide that excellent advice. Question number five, Foisal Chowdhury. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask this First Minister, what action the Scottish Government is taking to ensure that dentists are suitably funded to be able to continue taking on NHS patients, in light of reports that some dentists in Edinburgh are ceasing to accept NHS patients altogether? First Minister. This is a serious problem that has been exacerbated, of course, uh, by the global uh, pandemic. And there has been, uh, I'm pleased to say, an improving picture in NHS dentistry since the pandemic, uh, building on that progress is an absolute priority for the government. Uh, we've been working closely with the British Dental Association Scotland and the wider sector on payment reform, which actually launched just yesterday. Uh, this is the most significant change to NHS dentistry in a generation. It provides practitioners with a whole new suite of fees that are designed to provide a full range of care and treatment to NHS patients. Uh, I'm very confident that reform will provide longer term sustainability to the dental sector and encourage dentists to continue to provide NHS care, helping to further mitigate some of the access challenges that we are seeing. Boisel Chowdhury. Thank the First Minister for the answer. Uh, my, my constituent, Claire, was informed that her dentist would be privatised from January and they would need to start paying monthly fees or leave. This is not an isolated issue. Another family in the west of Edinburgh were also informed their dentist would be privatised. Both families were not able to find another dentist taking on NHS patients in their areas. Can I ask the First Minister to outline what action the Scottish Government have taken to support dentists and their staff to ensure they remain accessible for all? First Minister. As I've said, this is a, an extremely important issue that Foisal Chowdhury uh, has uh, raised and I hope that uh, when we can provide him with the details of the payment reform, that uh, he will see uh, that we are uh, doing our very best working with the sector to incentivise uh, NHS uh, dentistry. Just by way uh, of example, a dentist providing 
uh, a full set of dentures will now receive uh, £366.80. That's an increase of over 60%. Uh, in terms of a surface filling, we've increased the fee by almost 45%. So we're trying to incentivise that NHS uh, dentistry because of the issues that Foyzel Chaudhry is absolutely right uh, to, uh, to, to, to uh, mention. I would also say that we are working with the BDA and others in relation to the recruitment and retention of dentists, particularly in areas where we know the problem is most acute. Uh, so I will ensure that the Cabinet Secretary for Health uh, and Social Care does write to Foyzel Chaudhry uh, with a full uh, detailed response of all the actions that we are taking in this regard. Question number six, Mark Ruskell. Thank you. To ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government is making public transport more affordable. First Minister. We are taking a range of actions to deliver an affordable public transport system for people right throughout Scotland. Earlier this week, we announced that £2 million will be made available in next year's budget to progress free travel for people seeking asylum here in Scotland. We also this week announced the expansion of the existing National Ferry Concessionary Travel Scheme to all island residents under the age of 22. Uh, right now, passengers throughout Scotland are also benefiting from low fares as a result of our decision uh, to trial to pilot the removal of peak fares on ScotRail. And with thanks to the most comprehensive concessionary travel scheme in the UK, over 2 million people are eligible to benefit from free bus travel, with over 3 million journeys taking place every single week. Mark Cruskell. Can I thank the First Minister for outlining those successes? Free bus travel has been described as life-saving for people seeking asylum. And when those people, having escaped from persecution, war and suffering, are now forced to live on just £6 a day, the very least that we can do is to extend a hand of help. Does the First Minister agree with me that it is our responsibility to use the full extent of our powers to welcome those forced to flee their homes? And does he agree that by extending free bus travel to people seeking asylum, we're showing that we are a country and a parliament that is proud to protect all those who seek safety here? First Minister. I think that is uh, absolutely well said by uh, Mark Russell, and I agree with uh, every single word of it. Uh, we have uh, long campaigned together, and we have done so often with uh, other political parties, the Greens included, against the UK government's inhumane asylum uh, processes. Uh, that have left asylum seekers, many asylum seekers, who are not able to work, of course, uh, almost to the point uh, of destitution. In fact, many of them in uh, destitution. So Mark Ruskell is right to challenge the Scottish Government to see what more we can do to try to help and try to assist. And that's why I'm pleased we've announced £2 million will be made available in next year's budget to progress free bus travel for people seeking asylum. It's an issue that our Green colleagues have been keen to pursue uh, with urgency uh, and indeed with pay. So this announcement is the next step in making sure that our transport system, our country, is fair and accessible to all. And I could not agree more with Mark Ruskell uh, that where, uh, those who, where people are seeking safety, sanctuary from war, from persecution, from poverty, extreme poverty, from hatred, then we have a responsibility, all of us, to step up to ensure that we help them as best we possibly can. Graham Simpson. Thank you. I'm sure the uh, First Minister would agree with me that the UK Government's £2 bus fare cap scheme is a very positive initiative. Um, it's made a real difference for thousands of people and encourages more people to use the buses. So when can we expect to see something similar here in Scotland? First Minister. <laughs> we have... Yes, that, uh, that lacklustre response from his own colleagues uh, is probably uh, quite uh, merited because we have, of course the most comprehensive, uh, very comprehensive uh, concessionary yeah. bus travel scheme, the yeah. most comprehensive concessionary travel scheme in the UK. Yeah. Uh, and of course, uh, we have uh, just expanded that, uh, as mentioned in my response uh, to Mark uh, Ruskell. And the point, of course, that Mark Ruskell makes, and I agree with entirely, is that we are having to step in here because uh, for asylum seekers, the origin, of course, of this question, asylum seekers, are suffering so badly because of the inhumane laws of the UK government. And because of those inhumane laws, because of the fact that the UK government are inflicting destitution upon many of those asylum seekers, we are proud to, have to, proud to step in, but we shouldn't have to step in. We shouldn't have to continually mitigate the worst excesses of the UK government. Far better we had these powers in our own hands, presiding officer. Alec Crowley. 
presiding officer, the origin of the question was how do we make bus travel more affordable? And the fact is that while we have a good comprehensive uh, policy in place for those up to 22, those over 60, it's that bit in the middle that people are finding very difficult. And it's people on low pay and low income that are asking the question. So the point about the £2, when Andy Burnham introduced the £2 fares in Greater Manchester, the, the usage went up by 10% within a month. When are we going to look seriously at helping that group of people who are low paid, struggling most, and finding bus travel unaffordable? First Minister. Of course, we can compare concessionary travel schemes right uh, across the UK, and I go back to the point that we have the most comprehensive concessionary travel scheme here in the UK when it comes to helping Let's those. Let's hear the first minister. Those uh, young people, when it comes to helping, of course, those with disabilities. Of course, older people are all being assisted uh, through this concessionary travel uh, scheme uh, that we have, and that, in turn, of course, is ensuring that there are millions of journeys every week uh, being made, which, of course, in turn. Uh, help those bus companies, particularly in the face of the challenges that they struggled with in the course of the pandemic. I should say to Alex Rowley, we do uh, also have um, our fair fares uh, review, and that is uh, to ensure a sustainable and integrated approach is taken to public transport fares. And of course, I'm sure uh, Alex Rowley and others will take great interest in that uh, when it is uh, published. But wherever we can act, whether it's on our buses or whether it's from removing uh, peak fares on rail or in our ferries when it comes to the expansion of the concessionary scheme, we will act uh, whenever we have the power to do so. Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, President Officer. For those living in the smaller isles in my constituencies, ferries to and from the Orkney mainland perform the very same role uh, as bus transport elsewhere in the country. So can the First Minister confirm that young islanders relying on these lifeline routes will also be included in any future free ferry fare scheme? First Minister. Well, of course, I uh, consider that a uh, very important point that Liam uh, MacArthur raises, and he raises uh, an important and crucial point that uh, these uh, links are, uh, are lifeline. They're important uh, to young people on islands, just as, for example, rail services or bus services uh, would be on uh, the mainland. So we will give uh, further details uh, in uh, due course, but uh, that point will be one that uh, is given serious consideration. We move to general and constituency supplementaries. If we're concise, we'll be able to get more members in, and I call Claire Hawhey. I'm sure that members across this chamber will join me in welcoming the emergency access naloxone scheme beginning this week. This will see access to potentially life-saving naloxone kits, which can reverse the effects of an opioid overdose being expanded to community pharmacies right across Scotland. Can the First Minister say any more about how this will complement the Scottish Government's ongoing work to widen access to naloxone as part of the national mission to reduce drug deaths? First Minister. Well, I'm very pleased that uh, access to naloxone is being expanded to community pharmacies right across Scotland through our national mission to reduce drug deaths and uh, indeed drugs harm. Uh, we've already invested more than £3 million in widening access to naloxone, uh, including through our emergency services like Police Scotland and the Scottish Ambulance Service. However, we are now going further, and this new nationwide service, which launched on Monday, is a welcome addition to existing services. It's been backed by £300,000 of Scottish Government funding, and it will ensure that every community pharmacy will now hold at least two life-saving naloxone kits. I'm very grateful to all those in community pharmacies who are supporting our £250 million national mission to reduce drugs deaths. Liz Smith. Uh, could I ask the First Minister when the chair of the El Jamil uh, Independent Public Inquiry will be in post? First Minister. Okay. Uh, that issue is one that, of course, we have to uh, consult with the Lord President. I think Liz Smith will be uh, aware of that. It will be for the Lord President uh, to be able to, 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 to nominate, nominate an appropriate senior judge uh, for the inquiry. So those discussions are very much underway. I do uh, understand uh, the uh, desire, uh, mm. completely understood uh, desire uh, for those who have suffered so badly at the hands of Professor El Jamel for pace and urgency. So there is no uh, dither or delay uh, at all uh, from uh, the government. Uh, simply we have to go through the appropriate processes. I will ask uh, the Cabinet Secretary uh, for Health to write to Liz Smith with further details. Uh, but of course I just reiterate that point uh, that currently the issue around a judge, uh, an appropriate judge being, uh, uh, an appropriate judge, uh, being nominated is with the Lord President. Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I draw members' attention to my register of interests? 
This afternoon, the City of Edinburgh Council is expected to declare a housing emergency following a call from Shelter Scotland. So will the Scottish Government now accept that there is a housing emergency in our capital city and will the First Minister look at targeted solutions and investment to increase housing supply in Edinburgh? First Minister. Uh, of course, uh, we will uh, watch those proceedings uh, very closely from uh, Edinburgh City Council. There is simply no getting away from the real challenge that Edinburgh City Council uh, faces in relation uh, to housing. And that's why uh, this government has a very good track record of not just building uh, houses, but of course socially affordable uh, houses. From April 2007 to the end of June 2023, we have delivered over 123,000 affordable homes, over 87,000 uh, of which are for social rent, including 22,994 uh, council homes. We, of course, are the party that also ended the right uh, to buy. That has protected an estimated 15,500 uh, social homes. And, of course, Sarah Boyack will be very aware of the measures that this government has taken in order to control rent. So we will, of course, continue to liaise uh, with Edinburgh City Council, as we would with other local authorities, in order to see what assistance we can provide uh, in order to ensure that we deal with the real significant challenges uh, they are facing in regards to housing. Co Camp Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the First Minister if he can provide an update on the Scottish Government's latest engagement with the UK Government regarding any plans for the medical evacuation of injured civilians from Gaza in the light of his commitment to treat the injured civilians in Scottish hospitals in the event that there is a medical evacuation? First Minister. I make the point that I've made in this chamber before that the people of Palestine, the people of Gaza, they are very proud people. They should not have to leave their land. Uh, but of course, many of them have been forced to leave, particularly those from North Gaza uh, to South Gaza. And of course, many uh, are lying injured and dying in hospitals, those hospitals vastly running out of fuel, uh, indeed vastly running out of medical supplies. So where we can uh, bring those injured people uh, for uh, treatment here uh, in Scotland, in the UK, uh, then Scotland is certainly prepared uh, to do that. So officials are in regular contact with uh, their counterparts in the UK Department of Health and Social Care. There's not been a request for the UK to receive medical evacuations mm. from Gaza, uh, but we hope uh, that if, if that does come, then the UK and indeed Scotland uh, will be ready to play its part. And I reiterate the calls that I've been making for many weeks now, that there must be an immediate ceasefire to allow a humanitarian corridor open, to allow supplies, including fuel, to come into Gaza, and of course for the bombing and the killing to stop. We have seen horrendous scenes over the course of just the last week alone, let alone the last uh, uh, three and a half uh, weeks, in particular the sickening uh, bombing of Jabalia refugee camp, which must be condemned in the strongest possible manner. Sharon Dowie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On Tuesday night in the Kirkton area of Dundee, large gangs caused chaos by damaging property, setting fires and blocking roads into a housing estate, prompting the intervention of riot police. This behaviour is unacceptable and Kirkton's residents deserve better. The police force is stretched due to funding constraints, making it increasingly challenging to handle large-scale incidents like this. So, First Minister, will you get behind the police? and reverse police funding cuts. First Minister. Uh, well, let's just first of all say very clearly that this was a very efficient response by yeah, Police absolutely. Scotland. We should thank our police officers yeah. for all, uh, uh, what they do every single day, which is putting themselves in harm's way in order to protect the public. Uh, in terms of the funding for Police Scotland, I've said on many occasions uh, in this chamber in recent weeks, of course, we provided this financial year an increase to Police Scotland in terms of their revenue uh, budget. So I'm very grateful, not just to Police Scotland, but also to the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and other partners for their swift attendance and their efficiency in dealing with what was damaging and reckless behaviour. Exactly. And of course, there is an open uh, investigation, a uh, police investigation underway, and I would urge anyone with information uh, about uh, that disorder to contact Police Scotland. And Carol Mockin. Thank you, presiding officer. Upper Lower have called for a cancellation of school meal debt. They have also identified through their research that, and I quote, income thresholds for free school meal eligibility have barely risen in the last 20 years. Indeed, delays to free school meal extension mean that some parents and families are now feeling the impact of this government's inaction. 
Will the First Minister back calls for a cancellation of school meal debt and will he consider an immediate uprating of income threshold to give working families some much needed relief and further reduce the likelihood of hunger in schools? First Minister. What I would say to Karen Mocken is, of course, we will consider any suggestion, not just from uh, trusted third sector partners like Aberlour, uh, but indeed from right across the chamber as we head into the budget uh, process. But we have, of course, a very generous free school meal uh, offer uh, that is uh, available and uh, as, as per my programme for government that uh, we will seek to expand that. Uh, but we know of course that we still have significant challenges around poverty here in Scotland. It is due of course to the Scottish Government's actions including the game-changing Scottish child payment that it's an estimated 90,000 children will be lifted out of poverty this year. But instead of having to mitigate continually the harm for Westminster such as the two-child limit, such as the benefits cap, such as the uh, rape clause, all of these issues, some of which we can mitigate, some of which I'm afraid we simply can't. It wouldn't be much better to have the full powers in our own hands so we can just reduce poverty but eradicate it altogether. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's order. questions. Point of order, Douglas Ross. I'm grateful, Presiding Officer. In his answers this afternoon, the First Minister said of the request for messages from the Scottish Government, and I quote, the messages themselves were asked for in September just a matter of weeks ago. However, commenting on this at the UK COVID inquiry, Jamie Dawson KC said, requests have sought not only information, but also access to potentially relevant messages. Requests for such information and such messages were issued in late 2022. So is the First Minister able to confirm that the Council to the Inquiry is correct? And if so, will he revise the statement he made to Parliament? Um, um, the, the point Mr Ross raises is not a point of order. Um, obviously, Mr Ross's comments are now on the record and um, there may be a response or otherwise. Um, it's certainly the content of members' contributions are a matter for the member themselves. At this point, we will move on. Well, we will ask the, the gallery and the chamber will be cleared and there'll be a short suspension before we move on to members' business.